welcome to Kids Rule TV, brought to you by English Heritage. I'm Esme and I'll be your guide on this time-travelling quest through English history. We'll be joined along the way by some amazing historians and curators and a Hello. few other helpers. So if you've ever wondered who built Hadrian's Wall or what the Tudors had for dinner, then you've come to the right place. Coming up in today's show, we'll be lowering the drawbridge and crossing the moat as we step inside the wonderful world of medieval castles. Joining us is castle lover and expert in medieval archaeology, Dr. Jeremy Ashby. We'll discover who was who in castle life and reveal how these fantastic fortresses were defended. We'll also show you how to make your very own castle out of cardboard and share a tasty recipe for a medieval pie. So let's begin this week's show. Now, to really understand the story of castles, we need to go back to 1066. William the Conqueror had successfully invaded England and become king after victory at the Battle of Hastings. To defend his new kingdom, William ordered a castle to be built at Pevensey, his landing place in England. The next day, he ordered another at Hastings, just a few miles away. Over the next 150 years, the Normans built hundreds more castles all across England and Wales. Some of the first castles were called Motton Baileys. These were mounds of earth inside deep ditches with wooden towers and fences on top. They were quick and cheap to build, but over time, they were replaced with more sturdy fortresses made of stone with high walls and defensive towers that were better at keeping attackers out. Sadly, many castles were left to fall into ruin over the centuries, but some became the homes of wealthy lords and ladies and still survive to this day. To explain how castles evolved over time, let's watch this animation. A medieval castle had two purposes. It was both a fortification and the home of a lord. The first castles were just earthwork enclosures. Later, earth mounds and timber towers were built, forming a type of castle called a mott and bailey. However, the timber constructions were vulnerable to fire, so shell keeps were built to protect the wooden structure within a stone wall or shell. During the time when the Mott and Baileys were being built, powerful noblemen were constructing the Norman Great Towers. There was no tactical reason for building them so high. The Great Tower, in all its forms, became a symbol of power and nobility. The Curtain Wall was the castle's most important defensive feature. At first, it was just a wall with a crenellated parapet, but over time, the defences developed. Wall towers were added. Fighting platforms were built, first from timber, and later stone. At the same time, gateways evolved from simple openings within towers to twin towered gateways, keeps in their own right. And castles built with an outer wall around the curtain wall were known as concentric castles. Inside, domestic life often centered around the great hall, where the wealthy could entertain guests with lavish feasts. In the case of fortified manor houses, battlements were more for show than defense. Medieval castles were considered so prestigious that the style was revived by rich men who wanted to appear as powerful as the noblemen of the Middle Ages. Now, if like me, you're eager to find out what it was actually like to live in a castle, then I know just the person who can help us. Hi, Jeremy, and welcome to our castle show. Hi, Esme. I'm thrilled to be here. Jeremy, can you first tell us about your job at English Heritage? Well, the first thing, my job title is the Head Properties Curator. And what that means is that I am the person who makes sure that our sites and buildings get properly researched so that we know how to look after them and, most importantly, how we get to tell people their stories. And since there are 420 properties that we look after, it's actually quite a big job. It will take me all my life to do it, and I'm really looking forward to it. And a bonus question for you. What's your favourite castle? I'm going to have to go for Rochester Castle. Um, first of all, I'm a castle nerd. I'm a castle specialist, and this is a fantastic castle. It's got a tower that was once upon a time the tallest castle building in Europe, maybe even the tallest castle in the world. 
But most importantly, I've known this place my whole life. I was first taken here when I was three, and I remember it scared uh, it scared me to death being taken up to the top. I've never fallen out of love with it, and uh, quite recently I actually came back, and now I live here again, having been away for 30 years. So th- that's going to have to be at the head of my list. Wow, that's amazing. So let's say it's the year 1300. What would it be like to live in a castle during medieval times? Right, well, you've got to imagine a place that's very busy. There's lots of hustle and bustle. It's going to be noisy. There's going to be lots of people, lots of coming and going. Nowadays, when we look at castles, we just see the bare stonework. And we don't, you know, it's hard to imagine the people Uh, It actually would be very colourful, all the clothes they're wearing. And actually, if you could go inside the buildings, you'd see paintings on the walls. You'd see hanging of of, of tapestries, as well as the smells of, of the cooking and stuff like that. There's also, you've got to imagine, the horses. And finally, uh, everyone's favourite, the smell of the toilets. It must have been pretty smelly. It really was pretty smelly. What you've got to imagine is our modern flushable toilets We didn't have any of that. You've just got a simple hole in the middle of a wooden board and underneath that, what comes out goes down to the bottom. So it all drops down. The poo or the gong, as it's called, is probably going to be lying around and that's one of the things that you would smell inside our castle, I would think. Grim. So they don't sound like the most hygienic of places. I'm also guessing they didn't know about germs in medieval times. Well, no, they didn't know about germs. They did know about smells. They say, well, you know, they don't stay in one place for too long. And half of the reason why they travel around all is to give people a chance to go and clean out the toilets. So who would have lived in the castle and what different roles did they play in daily life? Okay, there are lots of different people and they're going to be men and women. That's quite important to to say, each of them with their own individual role to play. And they go from the very rich to the very poor. Right at the top, for some castles, you would genuinely have kings and queens living there. Some of the the most famous castles, most important ones that we look after, were royal castles. So Dover Castle, that's just one example really had kings and queens in. And that would mean that they would have their friends, their courtiers, the people that look after them, their servants are in there. And then when you start to go down a little bit further, um, conditions perhaps get a little bit simpler. So the king and queen, they have very fine, luxurious rooms. But if you go down, perhaps to the level of you know, individual servants within the household or, or, or soldiers even, they're living in much more Spartan conditions. So, you know, really, it's, it's, it's very, very varied, but there's a lot of people, a lot of different people, all doing different jobs, day and night. Now, when we talk about castles, the first thing that springs to mind is knights on horseback. Would they have actually lived in the castle? Yes, some of the time Ooh, they yeah, would have yeah. done, although I think it's important to note that not all the people that lived in castles were knights, and knights might spend their time in other places as well. Sometimes they would actually live in perfectly normal houses that didn't have uh, all the fortification. But, you know, in our typical castle that we've been thinking about, during peacetime, some of the people that are going to be there are not going to be knights. They would be soldiers of lower grade. Maybe there would be something like 20 or 30 soldiers in a garrison. They're the people who open the gates. They pull up the drawbridge. They uh, check everyone when they come through. And at night, they actually patrol Uh, on the tops of the walls, checking that actually nothing untoward is happening and sounding the alarm if it does. Now, we've talked about those with a higher status. What about the everyday workers and servants in the castle? Running a castle is a huge operation. It's a really big thing and it needs quite a lot of people to do it. That All of the rich people that we're talking about are going to have servants of their own and these are the people who, you know, make sure that they are fed they, they work in the kitchens. They make sure that they are properly dressed. They, make, they, they move all their furnishings around. They make sure that their clothes are properly mended and are, are all ready for them. And some of the people who might be staying there might even be the children of wealthy people who they would be living in the castle and you know, in order so that they learn the ropes, as it were, so that they learn... Um, the behaviour that would be expected of them when they grow up and they become knights or noble men and women, you know, in their own right. 
those are the, the, the most important people. But some of the servants' jobs are really a bit grim. So if I were living in the Middle Ages, I think that living in the kitchen uh, might not be the best of jobs. I think sometimes, you know, the, the descriptions of them, they're hot and greasy. The people, for example, who, you know, turn that the handle so that it, within the, the cooking fireplaces so that the meat keeps turning. I think that would actually be quite a tricky job to have. And once again, down right at the very bottom of all the things are the people who look after the toilets. I've got to talk about them. The job that I think I really would not fancy is the gong farmer, as he's sometimes called. He is the very unlucky person who has to crawl into the pit underneath the toilet and shovel out what's down there and take it away in a basket or a wheelbarrow or something like that. That would be a very unpleasant and smelly job, I think. Yeah, I don't think I fancy that job at all. And what would the women do in the castle? Uh, well, women actually do some varied things, and some of their jobs actually might be quite nice. Um, at the lower end of the spectrum, I get some idea that women might work in the kitchens. They might be bakers, although most of the chief cooks are probably in a castle are probably going to be men. But uh, higher up the scale, you've got women uh, in the households of noble uh, lords and ladies, particularly as ladies in waiting, looking after perhaps, you know, the lady of the castle or the wife of the officer in charge. Um, so they'd be all d d d doing a, a pretty nice job, I would, I would have thought. I do like the sound of that a bit more <laughs> than the poo. Well, thank you, Jeremy. It's been so interesting talking to you and we'll be speaking to you a bit later. Bye, Esme. Talk to you later. Now, to find out what life was like for a medieval noblewoman, we sent two English heritage members to meet Margaret Brotherton at Framlingham Castle in Suffolk. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Olivia. And I'm Felicity. We're here at Framlingham Castle to meet Margaret Brotherton, Countess of Norfolk. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here to my castle at Framlingham. I understand that you would like to know more about the life of a medieval noblewoman. That's right. In order to be truly noble, you must dress as I do. Well, you both look very fine indeed, and you will grace any court in all of Christendom. What's it like to live in a castle? Do you have to climb lots of stairs to get to your bedroom? Oh, there are many steps in a castle. I myself have a room right at the top of the castle, which has the most magnificent views across my estate, and I feel very at home up there. How should a countess behave? It is your duty to maintain the great traditions of your heritage and to represent your family well by showing courtesy. For example, you must show excellent table manners. You must always place a napkin over your left shoulder or over your left wrist. You must never wipe your mouth upon your sleeve. That will never do. You must make sure that you never rest your elbows upon the table. You never use a fork as something to eat with. Instead, you will carry your own knife and you will stab your food and then you will remove that piece of food from the knife. And if you are offered a drink by your host, first you must wipe your mouth with your napkin and then you must accept a drink from the cup using both hands and then return it to your host. Do you have a lot of parties and what do you eat? Oh, I love to have feasts here. I love to dance here. Would you like to have a look at my accounts? And you can see in detail all the things that I ordered over the year. 70,321 loaves of bread, 40 casks of red herring, 721 carcasses of beef, nine wild boar, 151 carcasses of pork, 697 carcasses of mutton, 24 pounds of saffron, and finally, 2,200 gallons of red and white wine from St. Emilion. What are you most proud of and how do you want to be remembered? Well, I am most proud of having lived a long and prosperous life. I have always known my own mind. I have always lived fearlessly. I have been 
persuasive in my time. I was married at the age of 15, not much older than you are now. As such, I was not happy in that marriage. I did my best to get out of it. So I've had an interesting life, shall we say. Thank you for telling us about your life. Thank you. You are very welcome. It's been a great pleasure to have your company here. Thank you, Margaret, for sharing those excellent table manners with us. Who knew that they didn't eat with forks in medieval times? Oh, sorry. Well, all that talk of feasting is making me hungry. Let's see if we can find a recipe. All right, here we go. This one sounds tasty. Medieval pie. If you want to try this recipe at home, you'll need one tablespoon of olive oil, an onion, one carrot, a stick of celery, 600 grams of beef mince, diced chicken or a vegetarian alternative, one tablespoon of plain flour, 350 millilitres of stock, half a teaspoon of both ground ginger and cinnamon, a quarter of a teaspoon of both cloves and nutmeg, salt and pepper, one sheet of puff pastry, and finally, one egg. Fortunately, I put one in the oven earlier, which should be ready by now. So, and here it is. Smells delicious. Let's have a taste. Mm. So we've learned how castles were home to noblemen and women in medieval times, but they were also used as fortresses for protection. To find out more, I think we need our expert again. Jeremy, where are you? Hello, I'm right here, Esme. Great to have you back. Can you talk us through how castles were defended? I certainly can. Um, the first thing you'd notice if you go and see one of our bigger castles is they've got lots of lines of defence. So you'd have not just one wall around the outside, but a second castle wall. And that's going to make it a lot harder for attackers to get in. And for some of them, around outside that wall, you'd also get a large ditch, which might even be filled with water, and then we'd call it a moat. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get across that without a boat. And how did the drawbridge keep attackers out? Well, the drawbridge, as you may know, is, is, is a bridge that actually is not in a fixed position. It, it flips up and down. And during peacetime, the drawbridge will be down and everyone can just walk in and out. But during times of emergency, they just pull on the ropes or on the chains and the drawbridge comes up to a vertical position. And you just, as I say, you just cannot get across the ditch or the moat. That's not the only kind of defence that you have. Look at the towers of castles, for example, and you might well see in the stone wall, there would be thin slots in the stone wall, and these are called arrow slits or arrow loops. And behind those might be standing someone with a crossbow or a bow and arrow who can shoot at attackers, but you can't really get to him uh, from the outside. If, for example, you did manage to get across and you managed to stand inside the gatehouse, you might come up against a very cunning device called a murder hole. Sounds pretty sinister, doesn't it? And what that is, is if the attacker gets close to the gate and is trying to burn his way through, then water can be poured down on top and put the fire out. And according to legend, at other times they might even drop stones or boiling oil down them to really put people off. And I think it certainly it would put me off. You know, generally, castles, they've got high walls, they've got high towers, they've got portcullises, they've got all sorts of devices, but their whole design and architecture is scary and it really puts people off from attacking them unless they really feel that they've got a chance. Absolutely. How about the pattern at the top of castle walls? What was that used for? Ah, now I think what you're talking about there is the battlements. You know, this is the thing that actually is most distinctive about castle architecture. It's the squiggly the, some bits go up, some bits go down. They give protection to the sentries, the guards on the top of the wall. They can hide behind the sticky up bits and then when they're ready, they can actually shoot their crossbow or their bow and arrow out through the gaps between them. That's very clever. Um, OK, so we know how to defend a castle, but what about the people attacking? What tools and techniques did they used to use? 
Yeah, there's a lot of complicated stuff in what's called siege warfare. Siege is a funny word, and it actually comes from a Latin word meaning to sit down or occupy. You imagine the attackers are just sitting around the castle. Well, they don't just sit around. Other devices they have, they have something called a siege tower, which I always like the sound of. Basically, it's a big wooden tower on wheels. And what you would do is you roll that up. If there isn't a moat or a ditch, you roll it up against the wall of the castle. And inside, the attackers can climb up and hopefully jump over the wall and get inside that way. Wow, how clever is that? Uh, well, even if you haven't got one of them, uh, the, the sort of cut price version of that is just a long ladder. If you're brave enough, that's pretty effective sometimes. Or if you don't have the head for heights uh, and you can't do that, a battering ram. The weakest point of a castle's defences is its gateway. So if you can bash your way through that, that's definitely going to be quite a good technique. Or... If you're a very, very well-provided attacking army, you might use a siege engine, something like a bit like a catapult. And the most famous example of this in the Middle Ages was something called a trebuchet. It was a huge stone-throwing machine that could throw stones many hundreds of metres and even break down the thick walls and towers of castles, the really terrifyingly effective things. So... If I were attacking, yeah, if I'd got a trebuchet, that's probably going to be my favourite. <laughs> that's your favourite method of attack. Would attackers also go underground? Yeah, that's a bit more uncomfortable, but it also can be effective. And we know that sometimes they dig, dig tunnels to try to get to the foundations underneath walls and to knock them down that way. Famously, here in Rochester, in there was a siege in 1215. The attackers used the fat from 40 pigs... Uh, to, to burn through the wooden pit props and they managed to bring down the entire one corner of, of, of the central tower. So it was certainly very effective. But even if you don't have access to 40 fat pigs or anything else like that, there's always going to be one thing that you can do, which is just to wait them out. You sit around the outside, you stop the people inside the castle getting hold of any extra food or water and sooner or later they're going to run out of food and when they run out of food, they have to surrender. And if any attackers were captured by the castle rulers, what would have happened to them? Well, it probably isn't going to end well. Medieval rulers tended not to be too slow in hanging people that displeased them. And I think, you know, if I'm an attacker and I get caught, that would certainly come within that category. If, for some miracle, I didn't get hanged, I would very certainly be thrown into some kind of dungeon. And dungeons aren't an invention of modern historians. They're perfectly real. You can go to several spaces inside castles and see real dungeons now. And there's a famous one at Carlisle Castle in the north of England where a number of stones in the wall are even called licking stones because the legend is that the prisoners were so desperate for, for water that they got the moisture that they could from licking the stones of the walls. That's how bad it could get. Oh, not very nice. Well, thank you for those fascinating and pretty gruesome details, Jeremy. It's been great having you on the show. Bye-bye. Thanks very much for having me. Bye. time to put what we've learned into practice by building your very own cardboard castle. Which side will you be on? Attack or defence? Ready? Let's get building. We're going to show you how to make your very own authentic castle out of your old cardboard. This design has been inspired by Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. For this, you will need four identical pieces of cardboard, a large piece of cardboard for the base, four cardboard kitchen roll tubes, string, two split pins, a sharp pencil, a black marker pen, a ruler, masking tape, a paintbrush and paint in blue, green, brown and grey, scissors, a craft knife with board, flags for decoration. First, you need to form the walls of your castle. Draw a crenellated pattern onto the top of your cardboard wall. Now you can cut out the walls of your castle. We are using a craft knife and cutting mat, but make sure that there's an adult to help you. To form the battlements on your castle towers, draw a crenellated pattern on the top of four kitchen rolls and cut them out using scissors. Next, 
cut a slit up the side of the tower to match the height of the castle wall. Then turn it around 90 degrees and cut another. Repeat the process with the three remaining tubes. These will slot over the corners of your castle. It's time to add a drawbridge. First, draw the outline of your door frame on the front wall of your castle. Then cut it out. Keep the door to hand as you will need it later. Next, take the large piece of cardboard to make the base. Use one of the walls to measure out the shape of your castle. Then, draw out a surrounding moat. Paint a grey square for your castle floor using your markers as a guide. Then paint your moat blue and your grass green. Now you can decorate your castle. Paint the walls grey first, then do the same with the towers. Don't forget to paint your drawbridge brown. You can even add in some windows in black pen. Using a pencil, make a hole either side of the drawbridge door and on either side of the door frame. Cut two pieces of string the same length and tie a knot in each end. Tighten the knots around the head of a split pin. Thread the pin through the hole in the drawbridge and fasten. Repeat on the other side. Assemble your castle by placing two pieces of wool next to each other. Make sure they're straight and secure in place of masking tape. For the final wall, you may find it easier to arrange it in a square shape. You can really see your castle starting to come together. Slot your towers over the four corners of the castle using the cuts you made earlier. Now you need to attach the drawbridge so you can keep out invaders. Thread the strings through the holes in the wall. Then create a hinge for the drawbridge using masking tape. Now you have a working drawbridge. Finally, add a flag for extra decoration. You can even add your own coat of arms. Now it's time to defend your castle. How cool is that? Here's my castle. Ta-da! I've even included a little door at the front. How did you guys get on at home? We would love to see your creations, so do share them with us kids at english-heritage.org.uk. That brings us to the end of our castles edition of the show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Don't forget to subscribe and for more activities and fascinating history facts, make sure to visit the Kids Rule website. See you next time.